So I want you to imagine the following scenario. Let's say they picked you from your data team to create and to write a new ETL for the company. Maybe you're a new hire, but you have to prove yourself. So the company wants a new ETL. They're very eager to see some new statistics. This is going to change the way they handle business. A new ETL, maybe uh, all the new users which exist, their email addresses, uh, their time they spend on, their, on your website, you know, a couple of transformations, enrichments, the regular stuff. We all know that. So you want to impress, and you want to write it in Spark, because that's what you know. So you get Spark, and you run it maybe on Databricks, or you create an EMR on AWS, or maybe you run it raw on uh, your uh, Kubernetes cluster, right? And you use Zeppelin or your Jupyter Notebook to visualize the data and to see and analyze the data. And you use some sort of automation tool to create and to run your ETL. And you're having a great time. You're really showing what you're worth. You are a superstar. But suddenly, things somehow get out of hand. Suddenly, your ETL is not performing the way it should. The numbers don't add up. So you run between window to window. You go to your Zeppelin, to your Jupyter. You try to figure out what is wrong. You can't debug on your local laptop, because Spark won't run on your laptop. And you can't get the data onto your laptop. And somehow, everything falls apart. This deep sense of overwhelming suddenly creeps into your bones. And you understand that you're not going to achieve your goal on time. So what if, I, what if I would show you that you could do all of this from the command line on your laptop? Let me take you on this journey to reimagine big data. And let me help you run your big data analysis on your laptop. Let's take a step back. Let's try to understand, first of all, what is big data? So big data was originally associated with three key concepts, the three Vs, if you will. Volume, velocity, and variety. Velocity, by the way, is, a, is the major reason why we have those big, big data warehouses today. But there is another explanation for or identification for big data. And this you can see on Wikipedia. Big data primarily refers to data sets that are too large or complex to be dealt with by traditional data processing application software. Well, so let's talk about those data sets that are too large or complex to be dealt with by traditional data processing software. And I want to challenge you. Do you really have big data? I worked for this client once. They had a really large ETL. They wrote it in PHP. I had to translate it to Apache Spark. And uh, it, it took an hour to run. And the input was from one database. The input was maybe 10 gigabytes. And it ran for one hour. And on a good day, the output was maybe two or three new entries in another database. Well, I did use Apache Spark because that's the tool we had. But again, I want to challenge you. Is this really big data? The promise of big data states that as a company on the line, they, over time, they accumulate large quantities of data, and you will need to process all of this. But the reality is that most of the time, you actually process only a very small subset out of all of this data. And more often than not, you don't even have that much data to begin with. The modern data stack gives us a lot of tools for each step in our ETL pipeline, right? Sources, destinations, transformers, uh, transformations, synchronization tools. We all know the big data tools, right? Databricks, Spark, BigQuery, Snowflake, Trino, Be uh, Beam. And if that's not enough, just pick one from here, right? But how many companies really have big data? So it turns out that most companies they have a lot of data. 
but they're staying somewhere in the 100 gigabytes. And then there are some companies, they have a couple of terabytes, but not more than that. And of course, there are the unicorns, they have petabytes. So I would like to introduce a new term, biggish data. Data sets that were too large or complex to be dealt with by traditional data processing software. Let me introduce to you DuckDB, a non-traditional database to deal with large or complex data sets. The definition of DuckDB is a mouthful, okay? This is on their website. DuckDB is an in-process SQL RDBMS OLAP database management system. Great, a lot of words. Let's break them down. So in-process, meaning it is embedded, it is not installed. SQL, of course, we write DuckDB, we write SQL language. RDBMS, meaning it can handle relationships, it understands relationships, and OLAP, well, that's the online analytical processing. If we would categorize the uh, databases over embedded versus standalone and transactional versus analytical, I would say that standalone transactional would be Postgres and MySQL, right? And analytical standalone would be Rockset, ClickHouse, Apache, Druid. There are lots of databases in that section. Embedded transactional, we would have SQLite and SolidDB, and there are even more. And DuckDB is in this quadrant, which is somehow fairly new. So how do we use DuckDB? Very simple. You download the binary, you write DuckDB in your CLI, and there you go. You get a prompt. And now you can write SQL using DuckDB. Or on the other hand, you could use it in your programming language. Here, for instance, a small example using Python. But you're not limited only to Python. You can use a lot of languages. So we have, um, we have the command line. We have Python, R, Java, Node.js, Julia, for those who don't know a fairly newer language, C++. DuckDB is written in C++, and there is ODBC, and there are even more languages which are port being ported. For instance, Rust has ported DuckDB as well. Great. Now, after this introduction, what's in it for me? Why do I need to know this? Well, it depends whether you're a data scientist or a data engineer. As a data scientist, you can use DuckDB to analyze data on your laptop, or you can use it as a simple data format translator. And as a data engineer, you can use DuckDB for biggish data ETLs, and you can use it to declutter your data stack. Right. Let's see it in action. So here we go. We are running on four gigabytes of data, some airline data, which I pulled from the United States. Let's see, first of all, how much data we have in those parquet files. Great, 71 million rows. That's nice in four gigabyte parquet files. Okay, first, let's see the schema. Very simple. Um, this is only so it fits on your screen. We can see now the names of the columns and the types. Uh, let's try to summarize a column. Let's understand the maximum, the minimum, the average. Here you can see with a simple command, you can see that. Okay, let's find out who has the maximum delays. Okay, this will be interesting. Let's see. Northwestern, Northwestern, and afterwards we have American Airlines. They had the maximum delays. And let's try and see a little bit more computation, some averages, right? Let's see who had, over the years, um, in average, they had the most delays. And here we can see EV. I forgot the name of this airline, but uh, they're out of business. This might explain why. This is, by the way, in real time, so this is no uh, speeding it up or anything. This is how fast it runs on four gigabytes of data. If you want to use it in Python, you can use it 
as follows. Just run your SQL within Python, but that is a bit crude, right? We would like to have it a little bit more uh, programmatic. So there is a Python composable syntax. As you can see, we can do aggregates and order and stuff like that. So we can pass this object around using functions. And depending on what, you can have different functions adding onto your, um, your object to run the query in the end. As a format translator, you can use DuckDB very easily. As you can see here, DuckDB minus C, run this command. I give, I give the command there at the command line. Very simple. A simple read from a certain file. And I want it to write as a parquet file. And voila, this just works out of the box. This can even be taken and used in a bash script, for instance. In terms of data accessibility, so what can you translate and what can you do with it? So we have CSV, right? We can actually use also JSON, reading and writing, and of course, parquet files. The data access is what makes this much more interesting. We can use it from local disk, okay? We can read files directly from S3. We can also read directly from HTTP. And if we read only part of a file, only a couple of columns, then this is the data which is going to be uh, downloaded to your computer. So this is very efficient. OK, great. That's great for a data scientist. But how about a data engineer? So let's talk about a biggish data ETL. A classic ETL is as follows. You have your sources, right? You have your transformation tool, and you have your destination, a warehouse or a data lake. And of course, you have some sort of tool for your synchronization and automation. So let's talk down, to, uh, let's talk about the basics. So we could have here Apache Spark, um, either on Databricks or not, and then we would have here Apache Airflow, right? Very basic. Now, what's the problem with this? Well, first of all, Databricks is expensive. Running Spark is expensive. And Apache Spark is complicated, and maintaining difficult ETLs is even more complicated and very time consuming. You have a very large data stack, but you only have biggish data. So I suggest this. Instead of having this whole large data stack, let's just keep our airflow and run DuckDB in process. So people would argue, OK, great. Why not use Pandas? This has been around for some time. We can definitely do it in Pandas. But there is a problem. First of all, Pandas is single-threaded, while DuckDB is multi-threaded. Pandas has a memory consumption problem. It reads the entire column, and DuckDB reads everything in batches, meaning Pandas has a problem with large data while DuckDB not only doesn't have a problem, it tries to fit all the data into the level one cache of your computer. So this means ETL using DuckDB. First of all, data does not need to fit into memory. It is enough that the data fits onto your hard disk. It only uses the columns which are being read and if there is a problem with the memory, there is a graceful degradation, meaning DuckDB will never fail. It might slow down, but it will never fail. So here is an ETL example. Very basic, right? Some SQL, some averages, nothing fancy. But what you could do is use DBT, just as we heard from the lecture before by Sam we can write a schema, and we can implement it on DuckDB. So I had this client. They came to us, and they said they had a huge problem. They have new clients, and they couldn't scale. They couldn't load all their data. So of course, we came, and we said, great. Um, we looked at the data. We saw a lot of data. So great. We need Spark. But then as we got on and we analyzed more and more, we saw that actually the initial load was really heavy. But the deltas afterwards were very small. So using DBT, 
we had the initial run running on Spark, and then after, we had dbt run on DuckDB. We saved a lot of money and even more time, because DuckDB just runs much, much faster. So let's see a uh, short ETL running on DuckDB. This time, we want to make it a little bit I'm a little bit bigger, so we have 55 gigabytes of data on my computer. Let's see how many rows or how, many, how much data we have. This is New York City taxi data. We have 1.7 billion rows in this data set running on my computer, which is over there. Great. Um, let's see the schema, right? A lot of data. We can see the column types. Beautiful. Um, let's run something really big. I want to see per year, the average amounts of fair amount, tip amount, and trip distance in New York City per year, grouped by and ordered by year. Great. OK. As you can imagine, 55 gigabytes of data, even in Perquet, this will take some time. The question is, how much time? OK. Let's all wait together, right? So as this progresses, suddenly you'll see that, oops, in the end, it gets much faster. And this took about 20 to 25 seconds, depending on the hour of the day and the mood my computer was in, 25 seconds to process 55 gigabytes of data. Don't take my word for it. Let's see where we can see DuckDB in production. So there is this company called Rill. They have data dashboarding, and they wrote a nice blog post stating why they implemented DuckDB. Right? You can read this online. They move down. They have much, much faster data analysis in their browser, in their um, software now. Same goes for another company called Mode. They're doing basically the same thing as Real, and they also they switched to DuckDB and had a huge performance gain. And of course, there is a company called Mother Duck. They are actually the ones behind DuckDB. They have a data lake based on DuckDB. Um, this is not open source. DuckDB is open source, but Mother Duck, of course, is the, um, the way they make money. Very interesting stuff. I would urge you to go to their, um, their website and read uh, all of their blogs. OK, so small recap on what I showed you. First of all, analyze data on your laptop. Check, even 55 gigabytes of data. We can use it as a data format translator. Even if we get the data in a certain format online, we can extract it and bring it to our computer and format it into a format which we want on our computer. We've seen how to create a biggish data ETL. And I hope you understand that this way you can declutter your data stack. So I hope I gave you some idea. And I hope you enjoyed this journey of reimagining big data. Thank you very much. Uh -huh.